I've just spent the weekend getting acquainted with this enormous CR10 Max printer. In this video, I'm gonna compare it to the Pro and see if bigger really is better. This is a CR10 S Pro from Creality. The print quality, in my opinion, is amazing, but the launch was pretty rocky. There were several issues on this and it prompted me to make two follow-up videos with fixes. Now I've read in community groups that a lot of these things have since been fixed on the newer versions of these printers shipping out, but Creality has a new 3D printer, the CR10 Max. It certainly lives up to the name. In this video, we're gonna unbox it, do an assembly, and run over the printer to see if Creality's learnt from their mistakes and whether bigger really is better. Looking at the specs for this thing, it really does look fantastic. It's got many of the great features CR10 S Pro had, and that includes the genuine dual drive Bontec extruder wheels, the genuine Capricorn tube, and now let's add to that a genuine BL touch. That is so welcome, and it's gonna make this printer so much better. One other thing I'd like to note is that it not only comes with a 0.4 millimeter nozzle, but also a 0.8 millimeter nozzle which makes sense on a printer this big because it can speed up your printing time dramatically. Now, the other thing that's big is the price. We're talking $1,000 US. I'm sure it will become cheaper as it becomes available at other retailers, but it is a considerable investment. Anyway, let's get on with the unboxing and assembly. Wow, it really hits home how big this thing is when you see the bed. And the print area is 450 millimeters by 450 millimeters. And the height goes all the way up to 470. So unboxing done, it was well packaged. There was a big gash on the bottom of the box, but with all the appropriate foam, nothing was damaged at all. This printer is enormous. I'm not sure if I have a table big enough and that should be a consideration for anyone thinking about getting this. We have two main components. We have our base assembly. And at the moment, this electronics box is not actually attached, so I've just got it resting there. We've got our vertical frame. Once again, absolutely enormous. We've got these pieces here, which I assume are gonna go end to end and be the braces to make the golden triangle. And finally, we've got a box with little odds and ends, sample filaments, some brackets, and most importantly, the instructions. So let's get this thing together. Okay, first step of the instructions is with these rods and we're looking for some right angle joints. That looks like them. Okay, we're gonna screw this into one end, roughly halfway, and then take a second one. It looks like they're all the same and screw it in to connect them. Next up, we're gonna take these eye bolts and we're going to put an M6 nut on each one. And then they're gonna screw into each end of these structural rods here. Our job now is to attach our long rods to these brace pieces. So these ones are going to go through. They're all the same nut and bolt for this. And they're gonna be T nuts to slide into the frame. And then we're gonna use the same one to attach the end of the eye bolt and then we'll have a link between the top of the printer and the main frame. Okay, our next step in the instructions is to actually attach this to here. So I need to rearrange things a bit so I have access. You can see that there's some holes under here and there's some pre-drilled holes in the top of this frame. So we're just essentially trying to line them up. Now this is designed to sit off the ground a bit. So you'll need to hold it up so these two halves actually touch. Otherwise the bolt won't reach through far enough to actually bite with the thread. Okay, that was a little bit tricky to align everything, but now it's just resting on the rubber feet. So this has actually got about close to five to 10 mils of clearance underneath. I can move it around the table without the corner of this scratching on the underside. The next step has us putting the main vertical frame on top of the main horizontal frame. I can see where the bolts are on each side. There's one side in finger tight. You never do up one side really tight until you're sure that both sides are in and everything is aligned. Otherwise you could put things out of whack or just make your life really hard. 
Now that I know I've got all four in, I can get the Allen key and start to actually tighten them. All right, there's our two halves attached, but now we need to introduce these rods here to brace everything up. There's one down. I'll pick a much better camera angle to show you how the second one goes together. So up the top, we need to remove this little cap and then our T-slot piece slides in. Get it flush and we can put this little cap back on. And I'm just gonna get my Allen key and do a very small tighten on this just so it doesn't fall down. Now the rest happens down the bottom. As you can see, that doesn't quite reach. So we simply unscrew this bit out. And once it looks like it's close, we put the nut back up out of the way and we'll tension that at the end. We can start to do this one up. Now, before I do up the top, I'm gonna to add the last brace pieces just to make sure everything's square. Just tightened up one of these braces. It's rock solid, so I'll show you how I did that. First step is to go back and tighten up all of these bolts. That includes the ones on the top, both on the outside, as well as the T-nuts on the internal part of the frame. Now it's time to tighten up these nuts here. You can see they're still loose and the whole thing won't be as rigid as it can be until we twist them down towards the metal rod to give some tightness and tension. And that's another one that's rock solid. We're extremely close to finishing off our assembly. What I've got here is the filament holder that goes on top. So we'll get that installed now. So that's all the mechanical parts together and what a monster this thing is. I think I could fit one of my children inside here if I needed to. Now we're up to cable connection. So I'll move the camera once again so we can see exactly what needs plugging in. We've got our main wiring loom hanging through at the back here and a lot of it's plugged in. There's not much left to go. So we should have a Z lead for each side. And the other Z one, I couldn't see it at first but it comes out on the opposite side and it goes directly in. Now our last remaining piece of wiring is this ribbon cable here. You can see we've got a separate plug for the BL touch. So I'm actually gonna do that one first because it looks fiddlier. And then there's a little slot here and we need to line that up with the cutout on there. Well, that's the assembly finished. We're ready to turn it on. But before that, I've bought back the regular CR10S Pro. I used to think this was big, but this will probably fit inside here. This is how enormous this thing is. Couple of observations that I've noted after putting it together. I'm going to need to fix where the BL touch cable plugs in. At the moment, there's big strain on that and there's a good chance that's gonna fail with some movement in future. The cabling for the heated bed has strain relief, but it's a little bit messy and my fiberglass sleeve that's around it is already quite frayed. So I'm concerned over that rubbing on things and wearing down over time. I might need to come up with something that holds it into place with a little bit more rigidity. Also, I'd like to note that when I was sliding it around at the start before attaching the electronics box, it scratched my table a great deal. So just watch out for that if you're doing this at home. And also this really wants to hang down instead of sticking up. I'm hoping I can fix that because otherwise it has a chance of knocking the model off and causing print failures. Apart from that, all the instructions were quite good. It didn't take too long to put together. I had to move the camera around a fair amount of time, but I think underneath half an hour comfortably is quite realistic for this. Let's turn it on and see what the manual says for the first procedures. Gonna turn down my volume. That's more like it. Very glad to see the genuine BL touch wired correctly and working correctly. And it will be interesting to see when I run the first test prints off the SD card, whether or not they've added a G29 to the start G code and it takes a new measurement. Let's load up some filament and do one of the test prints from the SD card. So when I looked on the SD card to find out which file to print, I saw there was a number of files and they were meant for various printers. Now the one for the CR10 Max, when I preview the code, isn't actually finished. So what I've done is run with the Creality CR5 version and I've added a G29 to the top because I saw it in the start G code for the CR10 Max. So I loaded the Ender 5 model and I watched the BL Touch do its thing. There was no preset Z offset, so the print started in midair and I needed a million presses on the LCD to set the Z offset. Eventually I settled on something like minus three millimeters. It ended up good, but some lines had been missed. 
So I restarted it and left it to run. So I just got home from taking the kids to the movies and I've inspected the prints and it really doesn't look that good. It's okay down the bottom, but it's obviously a lot of stringing and almost layer shifting up top. And then I noticed it. The duct had fallen off and failed in exactly the same way as it did on the original CR10S Pro. I fixed this instantly by borrowing the ABS aftermarket fan duct I printed for my Pro and I've left the link for that in the description. Go and attempt to get this off using the scraper that came with the printer. And we have my same complaint as the last time. That is not coming off easily. Okay, once I got the corner, it came up not too bad. With that first print out of the way, I was looking for something big that I wouldn't be able to fit on other printers, but I didn't want something tall that would take 10 days or something ridiculous like that. And what I found was this glider. I found that I could scale it up to 150% and still fit all of the pieces on the printer bed. I stayed up for a while to watch the first layer go down nicely, and then I headed to bed. So here we are approximately 20 hours later and I have my glider and it's a pretty cool looking thing. However, there were some issues. When I got up in the morning, I found that the print had failed. Fairly early on during printing, it had suffered from a fairly big layer shift. It was on the Y direction and there's a very beefy stepper motor and dual belts. So I was a bit surprised that this had happened. I then remembered during assembly that I tested how tight the carriages were but I hadn't tested the bed overall to see how tight it was. Despite the carriages being very snug on the V-slot rails underneath, this huge heavy bed was actually quite wobbly on top. And this is because it's mounted on springs as well as being quite heavy. Confident in the ability of the BL touch, I tightened the knobs the whole way down, compressing the spring until it effectively didn't exist anymore. Like the Prusa Mark III, I had made this bed solid. The only parts I could salvage were the two tail fins, so I removed those from the plate and I printed the whole thing again. The good news was this time it worked really, really well. The print quality on this is definitely up to scratch and that's impressive considering that I printed most of this at 200% speed just to make sure it would be done in time for this video. So what other issues did I have? Well, I did end up removing this conduit as I thought I would have to, not because it was touching the printed part, because it kept on jamming as the machine tried to home. I've gone for the simple cable ties with the two together and that seems light enough to hold itself up in the air and out of harm's way. So I've had a couple of new issues. Fortunately, they were easily overcome, but how did we go on this original list of problems with the Pro? Well, the fan duct failed in exactly the same way. Fortunately, that's an easy fix. The filament path is exactly the same as before. And although I don't have any dust yet, I'm gonna print another one of these Luke Hatfield designs because besides the printed plastic, all you need is an old skateboard bearing. Now, like the Pro, it still does have noisy fans. It does have quiet stepper motor drivers, but it's still quite loud in the room, especially the fan inside the power supply. The prints are still hard to remove, although I can figure it a little bit more on a printer this big. I've actually reviewed a tool that's good at this in the past, and that is the print removal tools from AMX 3D Printer Supplies. It's gonna cost a lot to change the bed on this on top of the starting price, so you're probably better off using the spatula to get underneath the corner and then spending a little bit of money on a set of these to pry it off gently and avoid cutting yourself. The best news here is the main problem from this printer in the past, which was the dodgy auto bed leveling sensor, is completely fixed with the BL Touch. After I set that original Z offset, it was set and forget, and I had complete confidence that the first layer was gonna go down properly every time, to which it did. The really sad news was when I tested for thermal runaway protection. On this printer, it's really easy to do. You simply bring the nozzle up to temp, and then you pull out the plug with the two red wires from the breakout board near the extruder, and monitor the LCD as the temperature starts to plummet. Sadly, I let this go for a couple of minutes. The temperature reached below 100 degrees without anything kicking in, and I was so desperate for it to be working, but maybe not showing up on the LCD that I plugged it back in to see maybe if it had cut power. But unfortunately, the temperature started to climb immediately. I just can't understand how a manufacturer won't enable something that's been present by default in Marlin firmware for at least a year now. One of my next steps will be to get the source for the Tiny Machines version of Marlin 
and adapt the sizes as necessary for this bigger printer. So that's a disappointment, but what's my opinion on this printer so far? Well, I'm not gonna lie. I like the novelty of it being so big and I've got some really big things planned for when I do my full review of this printer. And although there are some things that you would expect not to be a problem for a thousand dollar printer, at least for this printer, they're either free or very cheap to fix up. Now, one thing I will say about Creality is they are receptive to feedback. One of my patrons pointed me towards Naomi Wu's video of this from a short time ago. I could see already the improvements they'd made on this machine based on her feedback in that video. Some things of note were the genuine BL touch, as well as adding a second larger nozzle so you can speed up your print times. I'll reserve my final judgment until I've put many more hours into this thing and release my review, but I feel optimistic because I have identified some of the issues that I think are gonna pop up and I don't think they'll be that hard to fix. So they're my thoughts, but I'd love to know yours. I know this thing is expensive, but remember it's not a printer for an average person. It's for someone who has very specific needs, maybe cosplay, and they need to print things that are really big that just wouldn't be possible on any other printer. Please leave your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, happy 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.